This is going to be an overview of the book 2 Chronicles. This book has 36 chapters, 822 verses, and 26,074 words. And 2 Chronicles places the emphasis on the southern tribes. You'll see. And this book records the building and dedication of the temple and the degeneration that resulted from neglecting it. Chronicles was written by Ezra after the captivity was over, and it was used to show the people their history. But the first chapter through the ninth chapter, you're going to see Solomon's reign, while in the tenth chapter through the thirty-sixth chapter, you're going to see that how the, the kingdom is split. To break it down further, Chapters 1 through 9, you have the reign of Solomon. Chapter 10, you see the ten tribes rebel. 11 through 36, 14, you have history of kings leading to captivity. And chapter 36, 15 through 23, you'll see the captivity. Captivity. So, uh, the, as you saw in 1 Chronicles, it was a commentary like a commentary on First and Second Samuel. It discussed things that you saw in First and Second Samuel, mainly Second Samuel, while Second Chronicles is like a commentary on First and Second Kings. And while reading Second Chronicles, think about how these kings show you things about you and your own personal relationship with the Lord. You remember you don't have to just be reading about history here. You can apply these things to yourself practically and apply them to yourself every day. Just things that you learn about yourself by looking at these kings. And remember the true king of kings and lord of lords. 1 Timothy 6.15, which in times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. You'll notice that none of the kings are ever perfect. And none of them can live up to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So with that short introduction, let's go through each chapter. In chapter 1, you see Solomon's request for wisdom. And that's one of the greatest requests that you can have in prayer. In Second Chronicles 1, 7 through 10, it says, And that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father. And hast made me reign, made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge, that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this thy people that is so great? So Solomon is not really asking thanks for himself, he's asking for God to give him something so that he can be a good king to the people, so that he can judge the people. So when you're praying, if you're going to ask for something for God to give you, make it be something that you're going to use for his work. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. In chapter 2, Solomon prepares to build the temple. In Second Chronicles 2, 1 through 3, it says, And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord, and a house for his kingdom. And Solomon told out three score and ten thousand men to bear burdens, and four score thousand to hew in the mountain, and three thousand and six hundred to oversee them. And Solomon sent to Huram the king of Tyre, saying, As thou didst deal with David my father, and didst send him cedars to build in him a house to dwell therein, even so deal with me. So here in chapter two, Solomon prepares to build the temple. And as we talked about in First Chronicles, David at the end of his life there, as king, he was preparing the way for Solomon to come after him and to build the temple. And like we talked about, one of the greatest things you can do is you may not win the whole world. You may not win uh, the whole town to the Lord, but you can still help pave the way for the next guy coming up. And that's just by preaching and teaching the Bible. So Solomon prepares to build the temple. And in chapter 3, Solomon begins to build the temple. In chapter 3, verse 1, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem and Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father, 
and the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. So Solomon begins, begins to build the temple in chapter 3. In chapter 4, you see the furnishing of the temple, the lavers, candlesticks, altar of brass, the tables. In chapter 5, Solomon starts out things right by giving the Lord praise and not giving himself praise. At this time, he's little in his own sight, even though God's gave him so much. In 2 Chronicles 5, 13 and 14, it says, And it came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praises, praising and thanking the Lord. And when they had lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. In chapter 6, you see Solomon bless the people, and you see his prayer of dedication to the temple. And look what he says about God in verse 14 of chapter 6, and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven nor in the earth, which keepest covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. So even though Solomon strayed off and his wife's, caused him to get into false gods. You see, Solomon knew there was one true God. And that's just like many Christians. You see, they are worldly, and they sometimes don't act like they have a spiritual bone in their body. But if you sit down with them and talk to them about the Bible one-on-one, they know Jesus Christ is Lord, and that, that they should be serving Him. They have just given themselves over to the flesh. And Solomon knew that there was one God worthy of praise, even though you see him stray off and go after other gods. And then in chapter 7, you see something that you've never saw in your lifetime. In Second Chronicles 7, 1 through 2, it says, Now when Solomon made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house, and the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. So this shows that the Lord was pleased with what Solomon had done. And since we are operating by faith and not by sight in this age that we're living in right now, you don't see fire come down from heaven in the middle of your church service or anything like that. I know some charismatics talk about diamonds falling from the sky and tornadoes happening in the middle of the service. But God doesn't do that stuff today. But there are times when God is so in the preaching or in the teaching, or in the singing, that you feel closer to heaven, and the sinner feels like he is about to fall into hell, like he can actually see the fires of hell. And his heart's beating fast, and he's he's nervous. You know, things like this, that's as close as, as we get. But the Lord lets people know how to prosper while on this earth. In verse 14 of chapter 7, He says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal heal their land. And you need to do the same thing in your personal life. Humble yourself, pray, seek his face, confess your sin, and turn from your wicked way. Confess your sin of lust. Confess your sin of smoking. Confess any sin that you can think of that's separating you from God in the sense of your daily walk with God. And God will fix up almost every problem you have. He may leave a few to keep you humble, but watch your life do a complete turnaround if you'll just go by verse 14. Humble yourself, pray, seek His face, turn from your wicked ways. If you'll do those things, watch your life do a complete turnaround. But if you don't do this, there are consequences, just like Israel had consequences for their sins. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 19 through 20, he said, But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out of my sight, and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. So if you forget about what God said, and continue in your pornography, and your drugs, and your alcohol, and your fornication, and your gossip, and your cigarettes, and your tobacco, your clothes that are wicked looking, and all these things that you're doing, all this sin which does so easily beset you, 
then you're going to reap what you sow. You're going to feel God chastening you. There are consequences for sin. We're saved by grace through faith without works, but you still need to try your best not to sin. And then in chapter 8, it talks more about Solomon, Solomon's accomplishments. He built the Lord's house. He builds his house. He built houses for his women. In 2 Chronicles 8, 11, it says, And Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David unto the house that he had built for her. For he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy, whereunto the ark of the Lord hath come. So he even knew that this was a dirty woman. He wasn't even going to let her get in the holy places. But he built Pharaoh's daughter her own house. Probably couldn't stand to live with the little gold digger, but he just married her for political gain. Maybe a, a publicity stunt. But she got him out of the book, probably kept the TV on Family Feud and the Ellen Show and the Big Bang Theory and Game of Thrones, and it just drew Solomon's heart away from the Lord. But in chapter 9, you have the famous story of the Queen of Sheba coming to Solomon to ask him hard questions, and there was nothing that he couldn't answer. This pictures the sinner coming to Jesus Christ, and he has all the answers. And this is also should be an encouragement to you if you're dumb and stupid or idiotic about the Bible. If you're a Christian that doesn't know anything about the Bible, this should be an encouragement to you not to get destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you're saved and people know you're saved, people are going to ask you questions. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Solomon knew all the answers. He knew the answer to every question that the Queen of Sheba asked. And I want to be ready to answer every man that asks me a question about the book. In the past, when someone asked me a question about the Bible and I didn't know the answer, I would melt inside a little bit. But we need to know the book enough to tell people the answers to their questions. In chapter 10, you have Rehoboam. And this is Solomon's son who causes Israel to revolt because he didn't listen to the advice of the older men. He chose rather to listen to the advice of his younger friends. And as a general rule, older men have more wisdom. Today, I really rarely find an older man with much wisdom. But they still have more wisdom than the younger men. And God caused Jeroboam to lead ten tribes of Israel to revolt. And all that was left for Solomon's house was two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And this was only for David's sake. Notice that all the kings are always compared to David. But the ten tribes ruled by Jeroboam were called the house of Israel, and the two tribes under Rehoboam was the house of Judah. And this is the divided kingdom. You've heard somebody talk about the divided kingdom. This is that divided kingdom. In chapter 11, Jeroboam shows he is an evil king, replacing the worship of God with the worship of idols. In 2 Chronicles eleven thirteen through 17 it says, And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So you see that some of the people left Jeroboam and went to Judah under Rehoboam. So this shows it's okay to leave if the person you're under gets full of the devil, like Jeroboam. I mean, Rehoboam wasn't that great, but he was better than Jeroboam. It's like, it's like that with the church. If they get away from the book, then go where they, they're teaching the book. <clears throat> and this guy, Jeroboam, ordained priests for the high places and for the devils. And since the Lord has priests, the devil wants to copy Yod. 
and get priests. Everything God has, the devil gets a counterfeit for it. In chapter 12, you'll see that the kingdom of Judah gets into sin. And now the Lord raises up an adversary against them. In 2 Chronicles 12, 2, <clears throat> it says, And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. As individuals in your day-to-day -day life, you will see that many times when you stray away from God, like Judah did, he'll raise up an adversary, just like he did here. He raised up the king of Egypt to come against Jerusalem. Even if it is just some pest to pester you at work, God will raise up a thorn in the flesh to just give you a fit every day as a punishment or as, a, as chastening because you have strayed away from him. In chapter 13, you have Abijah who took over after Rehoboam and he ends up pursuing Jeroboam and Jeroboam never recovers strength in the days of Abijah. You see in 2 Chronicles 13, 19 through 22, it says, But Abijah pursued after Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with the towns thereof, and Jeshana with the towns thereof, and Ephraim with the towns thereof. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abijah. And the Lord struck him, and he died. But Abijah waxed mighty, and married fourteen wives, and begat twenty and two sons and sixteen daughters. And the rest of the acts of Abijah, and his ways, and his sayings, are written in the story of the prophet Ido. So Abijah took on many wives and seems to be living it up in victory a little bit. Even though God gave him victory, he's letting it get to his head. So always remember when you go through great victory, continue to seek the Lord just as much as you would in a crisis. Now next is one of my favorite kings and that is King Asa. In 2 Chronicles 14, 1 through 2, it says, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa his son reigned in his stead. In his days the land was quiet ten years, and Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. So that's an encouragement to know that sinful man can still do right in the eyes of the Lord his God. I'm a sinful man, but I want to do right in the eyes of God. So this shows that God forgives God's merciful to sinners and even though they're not per even though we're not perfect God still gives us a chance to be seen right in his eyes so verse 3 for he took away the altars of the strange gods in the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves so Asa completely cleans house here if he was king today with the type of power that he had then he would get rid of the pornography industry he would get rid of the human trafficking. He would get rid of abortion. He would get rid of the music and the movies that are destroying people's minds. He would get rid of the drag queen story hour. He would get all the drag queens off of the commercials and off of the TV. And all this filth that you see today, he's gonna get, he would get rid of it. And it says in verse 4, And commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. So he commanded them to seek God. He didn't say worship whoever you want to. And you see, this is the way it'll be in the millennium. You'll worship Jesus Christ or face the consequences. You know when the Lord Jesus Christ, if Asa is going to put away all these bad things, you know that when Jesus Christ sits on the throne in the millennial kingdom, we're going to have peace. We're going to have, you know, you're going to be able to walk down the street without seeing something filthy. God's going to get rid of all the dangerous things, all the bad things. It's going to be like heaven on earth. And he's not going to say worship whoever you want to. You either come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ or there'll be consequences. And if Asa got up behind the podium to speak, he would have used the Bible. In 2 Chronicles 14.5, it says, Also he took away, out of all the cities of Judah, the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. So, God gave Asa peace for a while because of how good he's doing. And when you get a place cleaned up, it will be quiet. 
Notice the kingdom was quiet before him. No gunshots, no screaming victims, no wicked music and cars driving by, no drive-bys. That's how it will be in the millennial reign, a time of perfect peace. It will be quiet. Second Chronicles 14.6 says, And he built fenced cities in Judah. For the land had rest, and he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. Notice that even though he had rest, he wasn't living it up. He actually built walls around the cities. So, and things may be going good for you right now, but that's no excuse just to sit back and do nothing. You still need to stay in the book, stay in prayer, stay doing the things that you need to be doing. Build fences and walls and hedges around you right now while you're at rest. Memorize a verse a day. Memorize a chapter a week. Study a chapter a week. Study a topic a week. Stay in the book. Build yourself a knowledge of the Bible. Hide the Word of God in your heart for when trouble comes. Don't just sit back and enjoy the peace and quiet. You need to get in the book, stay in the book. And then when trouble comes, you'll have all these verses in your mind. But it says in 2 Chronicles 14, 7 through 11, Therefore he said unto Judah, Let us build these cities, and make about them walls, and towers, gates, and bars, while the land is yet before us. Because we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought him. And he hath given us rest on every side, so they built and prospered. And Asa had an army of men that bare targets and spears, out of Ju Judah three thousand, three hundred thousand, and out of Benjamin that bare shields and drew bows, two hundred and fourscore thousand. All these were mighty men of valor. And there came out against them... Zerah the Ethiopian with an host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots and came into Marisha. Then Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in the ray in the valley of Zephatha at Marisha. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord God, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against the multitude, O Lord. Thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. So notice he trusted in the Lord to smite the Ethiopians, and a million Ethiopians coming against them. Asa didn't trust in his numbers. He trusted in the Lord. So he didn't have to make an alliance with an, another army to beat the Ethiopians. He wasn't trying to trust in his numbers. He knew if God be for me, who can be against me? So that's something you can use in your everyday life just because innumerable people are coming against you. Trust in the Lord because they that be with you is more than that be with them, even if you can't see them. Second Chronicles fourteen twelve through 15, So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with them pursued them into Gerar, and the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. And they smote all the cities round about Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came upon them. And they spoiled all the cities, for there was exceeding much spoil in them. They smote also the tents of cattle, and carried away sheep and camels in abundance, and returned to Jerusalem. So the story of Asa shows an illustration about how it's good to obey God rather than men. Many times people will ask, if we're supposed to obey our parents, does this mean I have to do wrong if they tell me to do wrong? The answer is no. Because look in Second Chronicles 15, verses 16 through 19. It says, And also concerning Mekah, the mother of Asa the king, he removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burned it at the brook Kedron. So Asa removed his own mother from being queen because she was living for the devil. She wasn't living for God. So this goes to show you that even though your mother or your grandmother, if they're living wickedly, or your grandfather, whoever, you don't have to go along with what they're doing. Just because they're older doesn't automatically make them wiser. It doesn't automatically mean that they're serving God. So you have to serve God, obey God rather than men, and you don't have to go along with what the world's telling you to do. Everyone around Asa was probably telling him, even his relatives were probably saying, 
that he's taking it overboard and he needs to calm down a little bit and it's okay to go to the high places every now and then and have a few little false gods every now and then. But Asa chose to obey God rather than men. And it says in verse 17, But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. So he didn't completely get rid of the high places. He didn't completely get rid of everything. There were some people still going to the high places, worshiping some false gods. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all of his days. And he brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated silver and golden vessels. And there was no more war into the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. And even though Asa did good and his heart was perfect all his days, he messed up close to the end of his reign. He didn't finish well. He began to rely on manpower. He began to rely on numbers to be victorious instead of relying on God like he did against the Ethiopians. But in 2 Chronicles 16, 7 through 9, it says, And at that time, Haniah the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord... He delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. So you see, Asa at one point, he was relying on God against the Ethiopians. Then he started relying on numbers. He relied on the king of Syria instead of relying on God. And so from thenceforth, he's not going to have peace. He's going to have wars. But then in place of Asa, Jehoshaphat, his son, began to reign. And he was a good king. It says in Second Chronicles 17, 3 through 6, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presence. And he had riches and honor in abundance. And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. So Jehoshaphat's a good king. He had a heart for God to the point that he had men sent out to teach about the things of God. And you can read about that in Second Chronicles 17, 7 through 10. But he, he was... His heart was so perfect before God that he had men sent out to teach about God. In chapter 19, the children of Ammon and Moab come up against Israel, but Jehoshaphat seeks the Lord. So the Lord takes care of them, and Judah and Jehoshaphat don't even have to fight. If you look at verse 17 and 18 in chapter 20, it says, "...you shall not need to fight in this battle." Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed, for tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Has, have you ever gone through something and it felt like the Lord just fought it for you? That's what happened here. It's like everything just falls into place. It's not a coincidence. It's because the Lord did it for you. He got you through it. Or have you ever been worried about something and you prayed to God, you called on God about this thing, and it's like when that time came to go through whatever that was, everything just fell into place. It's like the Lord just pushed you right on through it. So the Lord fought the battle, and all they had to do was gather the spoils. Many times you, you go through a battle, it don't even seem like you're fighting it, and then you just get rewards and things at the end. You just rack up on things at the end, the blessings of whatever it was, like they did. And in Second Chronicles twenty twenty four through 25, it says, And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies, precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. 
And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. So there was so much stuff that they got to take away from this battle that God fought for them. They couldn't even carry it hardly. And it took them three days. But next you have Jehoram reigning, the son of Jehoshaphat. Jehoram had taken Ahab's daughter to wife. So, you know, she was leading him down the wrong direction. I mean, her steps took hold on hell, leading down to the chambers of death. She flattered with her lips. She was a wicked woman. Jehoram was so wicked that he slew all of his brothers and did much evil in the sight of the Lord. And then in chapter 22, you see this other wicked person, a wicked woman named Athaliah, who starts to reign. And she destroys all the seed of Judah, except for Joash, because he was hidden. He was in hiding, so he didn't die. But in chapter 23, Athaliah is slain. The old hussy got what was coming to her. So in chapter 4, Joash, the one that was hidden, is made king at the age of seven years old. And he did right all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Notice it says he in chapter 24, he did right all the days of Jehoiada the priest. However, when Jehoiada died, Joash got into idolatry. So learn this lesson. When your favorite preacher dies... Don't stray off into the world. Find another man to give you something from the Bible and to help keep you in fellowship with the Lord. And really, you should really learn how to feed yourself the words of God if you can't get a, get a hold of good preaching. Or if you're going through a time of famine where there's no good preachers around you, figure out how to feed yourself the Bible and keep yourself right and not w just lean on somebody else to give you the Bible all the time. But in chapter 25, Amaziah becomes king. He's victorious in battle against the Edomites. However, he still let their idols turn him into an idolater. In verse 14 of 25, it says, Now it came to pass, after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir, and set them up to be his gods, and bowed down himself before them, and burned incense unto them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah, and he sent unto him a prophet, which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? This is so true. Why would you want false gods of people that have already been defeated by yourself? If you're born again, then you have a God living inside you that's victorious over every false god, the devil, and every principality and power. As it says in Colossians two thirteen through 15, it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Thanks and, and thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Bible says. So why should I go after false gods, which can't see, hear, or walk? Gods that have already been defeated. Gods that I would have to pick up and carry when I've already defeated them through Jesus Christ. The false gods we have couldn't deliver the enemy. They couldn't save the people of this world so why do we go after false gods like Amaziah did? Why would he bow down to gods of the people that couldn't even deliver them out of his hand? It doesn't make any sense. In chapter 26, you have King Uzziah, and he reigns a very long time. He was a good king. However, he had a downfall, and that is he was lifted up in pride, just like the devil. In 2 Chronicles 26, 16, it says, But when he was strong... His heart was lifted up to his destruction. And that's why the Bible says pride goeth before destruction and a holy spirit before a fall. You know when things worked out for King Saul? Samuel said when he was little in his own sight. So if you want God to bless you, then humble yourself before God. Matthew 23, 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But Jotham follows Uzziah as king. And it says in 27 and verse 2, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah did. Howbeit he entered not into the temple of the Lord, and the people did yet corruptly. So Jotham was a good king, but he didn't seem to have enough zeal. He didn't seem to be spiritual enough to the people. So the people weren't led in the ways of the Lord, and they did corruptly. 
Notice it said, Howbeit he entered not into the temple of the Lord. So could it be he was he was a good guy, but he just wasn't spiritual enough? Do you know Christians like that? It's like they're a good guy. They're a good guy. They're leading people in the right direction for the most part morally. But are they showing people how to be spiritually? Are they the spiritual leader of the home? Are they telling their kids to read the Bible? Are they leading people in the ways of God and being very God conscious? Or are they like Jotham, who was a good king but just didn't seem to have enough zeal so the people did yet corruptly? But then in Second Chronicles 28, 1 through 4, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, but he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. Once again, comparing the kings to the standard, which is David. And David is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. When men get to the judgment, at the great white throne judgment, what do you, what are they gonna? How, who are they gonna be? Have to be as perfect as to get into heaven? The Lord Jesus Christ. None of them is gonna be that perfect, unless they got saved and got the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when you get what what saves a person, you get the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's the standard. Just like David was the standard, and Jesus Christ is better than David. Because Jesus Christ was without sin. God compares all the kings to David because he's the standard. And when it comes to eternity, if you're going to get into heaven, you're going to have to be as perfect as the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the standard. One problem, nobody's as perfect as Jesus Christ. So God had to make a way to give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ freely because you can't earn your own righteousness and nobody can do good enough to be as perfect as Jesus Christ. So the moment you get saved, God gives you the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says, For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burnt his children in the fire, after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places, and on the hills, and under every green tree. So Ahaz was a wicked king who didn't learn from the mistakes of those who went before him. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel instead of walking with God. Very religious, but not a man of God. Some men are dedicated to serving the flesh, the world, and the devil. He sacrificed, but it wasn't to God. The next king is Hezekiah, and he does that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. He's a good king. He encourages the people to sanctify themselves. That is, clean up their act and to be set apart for the Lord's work. In 29 and verse 5 it says, And he said unto them, And said unto them, Hear me, you Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. So today the holy place is within you, because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you don't need to do anything wicked and sinful to defile your holy place. The place where the church meets should be set apart as an holy place as well. So if you're going to be like Hezekiah, then get rid of the filthy stuff. Don't defile the temple of God, which is your body. And where you meet with other Christians, get rid of the New Age Bible versions out of there and the rock music and the extortion and the false doctrine. But Hezekiah shows to be a true leader that can lead others to make right decisions for God. Look what he says when Sennacherib, king of Assyria is after them. In 2 Chronicles 32, 7-8, Hezekiah says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed, for the king of Assyria, for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So he's a good leader. He's a good king. He's got enough zeal and enough. He's spiritual enough to lead people down the right way. And that's to the Lord God. And in chapter 33, you see one, if not the most wicked king in history, King Manasseh. Manasseh. Set Chronicles 33, 1. 
through 7. Let's see how wicked this guy is. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places, which Hezekiah's father had broken down. And he reared up altars for Balaam, and made groves, and worshipped up all the host of heaven, and served them. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said in Jerusalem shall be my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times, and used enchantments, and used witchcraft, and dealt with a familiar spirit, and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he said a carved image. The idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son in, his, in this house, and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. So, you think about this guy Manasseh. This guy is like Hillary, Hitler, Bill Clinton, Obama, Putin, Kim Jong-un, and any wicked ruler you've seen. He's doing some wicked stuff. He's fooling around with witchcraft and killing kids and worshiping idols sounds like most high up political people today you know all that wicked stuff hillary's doing that i'm too even embarrassed to mention and you know how wicked bill clinton and obama is you know how wicked these people are and that's how manasseh was and Manasseh's, Manasseh had a good father, Hezekiah, who had broken down the high places. And then Manasseh is building back the things which his father destroyed. And he's making the people go backwards. But to him and to the people, this would be called making progress. They're making progress. They're evolving, they would say. Just like people today, they think, it's, they think making it legal to kill babies and to have sodomite marriages and to have extra rights for trannies, they think that's making progress. But they are completely stupid. They're turning the nation into even more of a sick, perverted joke. Rulers today mess around with witches and witchcraft just like Manasseh did, and that's a proven fact that you can research for yourself. The crazy thing about Christians today is they many times don't realize the government is evil, and they think the government is interested in giving the best for the people. But these rulers in the Bible weren't. And Paul said himself, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. If Manasseh was that wicked then... And men get worse. Why do you think these rulers today are just great Christian people? What do you think these rulers today are doing in the dark that you don't know about? However, Manasseh gets right with the Lord. That shows you a way that he's better than most of these rulers we had today because they're not going to get right with God. And Manasseh tried to fix what he destroyed. And Ammon, his son, reigns in his stead. In 2 Chronicles 33, 23 through 24, about this guy Ammon here, humbled him, humbled not himself before the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more, and his servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. There's your conspiracy. So there are conspiracies in the Bible, just like there are today. But the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon, and the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. So Josiah was only eight years old when he began to reign, and he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Can you imagine these seven and eight-year-olds being kings today? But they found the book of the law in chapter 34 during Josiah's reign, and he proved to be a man of the book, and people got right with God because of the words contained in the book. It showed their disobedience, and they fixed it. In chapter 35, you see Josiah keeps the Passover. You see he's a good king, but ends up being killed in battle. But he goes out like a warrior for God. He finishes his course. In 36, you see the decline of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar comes in and takes over. You're going to see the captivity. 
in Second Chronicles 36, 5 through 7, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. So this ended the Hebrew monarchy, and the Babylonian captivity began. Now, verses 9 through 13. Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. So you see all these major prophets and minor prophets. Most of them are actually preaching and prophesying during the reign of all these kings. And when you figure that out, you'll look at the Bible a lot differently because... It'll just to help you understand the timeline of the Bible. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. And a scary verse in chapter 36 shows what happens after constant rejection of the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 36, 15 through 16, it says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up be times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. And Proverbs 29, 1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, she shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. But 70 years later, Babylon fell to the Persian, Persians, and Cyrus, king of Persia, gave permission for the Jews to go back to their homeland. And here is the last words that a Jew would read in the Hebrew canon. Second Chronicles is his last book. 36.23, it says, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth that the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house for in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up.